Okay, so I know the beginning of this video had no audio, but that first page I think is decently self-explanatory. So we're picking up the explanation on basically day two of doing these notes, starting with the section on solving quadratics. So this section. Okay, let's go back over what we've done so far because we had a whole lunch break to forget everything. Um, we checked to see if guess and check method for solving, so factoring and then solving would work, and it didn't. So we went to completing the square. And what we did was we set up this formula by moving the constant value, the C value, to the other side and giving us some space to add something to both sides. The thing that we're adding to both sides is B divided by 2 squared. So that's the only thing you have to remember here. B is 2, so 2 divided by 2 is 1. 1 squared is also 1, so we're going to add a 1 to both sides. Then that allows me to immediately factor the left-hand side to x plus 1 squared. And this is 1 because this is 1. This just happens to also be 1 because 1 squared is 1. That won't always be the same. Okay, so then we take the square root of both sides. When we're taking the square root of both sides, we have to make sure we do the plus and minus thing. And then we have the x plus 1 equal to plus or minus square root of negative 4. And we remembered that the square root of negative 1 is i, the imaginary number. So the square root of negative 4 is 2i. So we're at this point right now, and we're like so close to being done. No, because we still haven't solved for x. We still haven't isolated the x yet. So, but that part's like real easy because you just subtract x to both sides. So this is going to be negative 1 plus or minus 2i. You cannot combine real and imaginary parts of numbers. So voila, we were almost there whenever we went to lunch. And that's completing the square. Completing the square requires you to set up the problem, do the uh, b over 2 squared, and then basically finish by square rooting. So that was the solving by square roots thing. Okay, most of the problems that we'll do, uh, uh, like 90% of them, you'll be able to factor in a normal way. I prefer guess and check method. I'm going to ask that you learn it because it's a time saver and a paper saver. But in the meantime, if you need to use whatever method of factoring you've learned, X puzzles, the little box, that's fine. I just want us to get to the guess and check method eventually. Any questions about this page before we move on? No, cool. Okay, great. Awesome. Let's move to the next page because we'll fac practice factor a little bit more with these next kind of problems. So for quadratic inequalities, also something you may have seen before, but I'm going to teach you probably an entirely new uh, notation for this. The first thing we're going to do to solve one of these quadratic inequalities is factor it completely, which means every single time we're going to start to see if the guess and check method works. Well, first things first, check to see if it has a GCF, obviously, and then guess and check method. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to find the zeros or the solutions of each factor, just like we did on the last page, and place these critical numbers on a number line. You're going to hear this a lot. I also get really lazy, and I just call them C numbers, critical numbers. Okay, critical numbers on a number line. Once we have those numbers on a number line, like just a regular good old-fashioned number line, right? We're going to test values from each subinterval and then write our final answer in interval notation. So we have, like in this like random example I drew on the side, we have three subintervals separated by the two zeros, and we're going to test values in each of those to decide if the inequality is true or false, and we'll be able to have our final answer. This one's kind of a, a long problem, so write with your smallest handwriting possible. That would be ideal. There's also a typo on the first problem, so if you would please... Oh, no, there's not. Does y'all say what mine says? 2x squared plus x. Okay, great. Can you change it to what mine says? Yeah, change the coefficient in the middle to a 1 instead of a 7, and then change this 6 to a positive 6. <clears throat> Fabulous. Okay, two things to notice before we start. Number one, this is not set equal to 0, so we will have to fix that first so that we can factor it. Number two is we need to make sure we're looking at what type of inequality we're dealing with. What type of circles on a number line would go with this symbol, open or closed? Open, because it's just less than. It's uh, exclusive, so that's an open circle. Okay, and then what is the name of that symbol? 
less than. Okay, great. So we're looking for things that are going to be less than, but not including the actual zeros because it's an open circle. It's not equal to, it's just less than. Great. So what we do is we just, first of all, set this equal to zero. And like I am actually going to say equal to zero. I know that this is an inequality. This is going to come back later, but we first need to find the zeros, which happen when it is equal to zero not less than zero, exactly equal to zero. So yes, I'm changing that on purpose. Let's practice the guess and check method that we just went over. How do I set this up? What goes in the first parentheses? 2x, and what goes in the second? Just a regular x. Fabulous. OK, we want factors of which number? 2, 1, or negative 6? Fabulous. What are the things that multiply to negative 6? 1 and 6 and 3 and 2. 1 and 6, 3 and 2. Some combination of those numbers, 1 and 6 or 3 and 2, is going to give me 1. Let's just try 1 and 6. If I do that, this is 12, this is 1. Can I make 1 out of 12 and 1? No. no. OK, so we try something else. We try this way, 6 and 1. That's 2 and 6. Can I make 1 out of that? No. No, so we try something else, 2 and 3. That's going to be 6 and 2. Do you all know where I'm saying these numbers from? I'm just saying numbers out loud. Do we? OK, 2 times 3 is 6, 2 times 1 is 2. Can I make 1 out of that? Yes. No. no. OK, so we switch it again. <laughs> yes, maybe this is a pencil move, maybe not a pen. This is going to be 4 and 3. Can I make 1 out of that? Yes. OK, so this would be 4x, and this would be 3x. Which one needs to be negative? Remember, we want positive x. Oh, yeah, three. So the 3 needs to be negative. So that means the negative goes here with the 3, and the 2 is positive. Great, we just factored it. We didn't have to draw an x puzzle. We didn't have to draw a box. Why does the 3 need to be negative again? If we were to do 4x minus 3, isn't that 1x? And that's what we want right here. Oh, okay. No, that's a really good question. OK, so at this point, we have factored completely. The next step, part B, says to find the zeros of each factor, which we did on the other page by setting each of the factors equal to zero using that zero product property. We can quickly solve these tiny equations to have x equal to 3 over 2 and x equal to negative 2. These are my critical numbers. So we factored, we use a zero product property, we found our critical numbers. The next thing we're going to do is place these critical values on a number line. I don't need it to be super accurate, so you don't have to actually count anything, but just make sure in their correct order, so negative 2 is smaller than 3 over 2. And then these, because now I'm looking back to the inequality that we're using, when I identify these on the number line, I'm going to be using an open circle because the inequality is an open circle. OK. I have three different subintervals. I need a value, a number from each of those subintervals to be able to test whether the inequality in those subintervals is positive or negative, is less than or greater than. So what I mean by that is, give me a number that is somewhere on the number line in the green area. Negative 3 will work, but we're going to be really obnoxious about it. We're going to use very obvious numbers and very easy numbers like negative 10. Negative 3 works. Negative 2.1 works. But if you use negative 10, it's like, it's like in that section, and 10 is a pretty easy number to use. Now, you can just straight up plug this number into the inequality to see if it is less than or greater than. But that's a lot of plugging. And we want to get used to using some mental math. So what we're going to do is we're going to test out all of these things using the factored form. And we're just going to check on the signs. If I were to plug a negative 10 into the first parentheses, 2 times negative 10 minus 3, would that end up being a positive number or a negative number? Negative. So we're just going to say that's a negative number. If I were to plug in negative 10 to the second parentheses, x plus 2, would that be a positive or a negative number? Negative. negative. What is a negative time a negative? 
positive. So that means this polynomial in the green interval is above the y or the x-axis because it's positive. This will start to make sense in a hot second. In the purple subinterval, what is an easy value to use in that subinterval? Ten. Ten is not in that subinterval. One. Oh. One is. There's an even easier number though. Zero. zero. Okay, we're gonna test with zero. If we were to plug a zero into the parentheses version, okay. Zero minus three, that's a negative number. Zero plus two, that's a positive number. What's a negative time a positive? A negative. So that means this section is negative. The polynomial, in this case a quadratic, would be underneath the graph. Give me a value in the orange subinterval. One. Ten. ten works. An easy one to use, ten. It's very obviously past three over two. It's just an easy number to plug in, so we're going to plug that in. If we were to plug ten, a positive ten, into the first parentheses, it would end up being positive. If we were to plug 10 into the second parentheses, it would end up being positive. Positive times positive is positive. That means this part of the graph is above it. Okay, fabulous. Now we need to, like, what are we even trying to do here? Am I right? Remember, we're trying to decide what values of x leave this original inequality true. And we said it's less than. So where on this graph, between what sub inter or what sub interval is the graph less than zero? What color? The purple one. So all we need to do is write in inequality notation the interval between two and three halves, which means we're going to say negative two exclusive parentheses, not bracket, comma three over two close parentheses. It's not a coordinate. It's an interval. Do y'all remember interval notation? Parentheses versus bracket. Mm -hmm. If it's an inclusive inequality, so that means if you're, you've got one of these, you use a bracket. And if it's one of these without the line underneath it, you use a parentheses around that number. Phew, a lot just happened. I know there's questions. So what part and where? All we had to do was take out the GCF. And then we noticed that it was difference of two squares. So we're able to factor it all the way out. After we factored it all the way out, look at the last example. What did we do? I think I heard that through all that mumble. Find the critical numbers. So we set each of the little parentheses equal to zero, including the GCF. It's not in a parentheses, but it is a factor. You can put it in parentheses if you'd like. But very easily, we can solve each of these tiny little equations. This would be x equal to 0, because 0 divided by 5 is still 0. This would be x equal to positive 2, and this would be x equal to negative 2. These are my critical numbers. These are the numbers that are going on our number line, which means I have more subintervals than I did last time, because I have three critical numbers. So we make our number line. Make sure you don't just like list them out the way they're on your paper. <laughs> Actually put them in number order. So that means negative two goes first. Here's zero. Here's two. On each of these dots, should I draw an open circle or a closed circle? Closed. Very good. Okay. So this time I have one, two, three. four subintervals that I need to test because I need to know what's happening for this polynomial at each point before and after one of those zeros. Let's do the blue interval. What's a good number we can test there? A really easy number we can test there. Negative 10. I agree. Now remember, we're plugging this in to the fully factored form. Air quotes over the world plugging it in because we're not actually plugging it in. We're just checking the signs. So that means we're checking with this guy over here. The first factor, which if it's helpful, I'll put those parentheses around it. The first parentheses, 
That will end up being negative. The second parentheses, also negative. The third parentheses, also negative. What's a negative times a negative times a negative? negative? Negative. Cool. Okay, so that's going to be down here. That's what my polynomial might look like. What's an easy number in the green subinterval? Negative, negative one. I agree. Negative 0.5 also works, but I don't want to do that number. So if we plug in negative one, plug in with air quotes, this would be a negative number, a negative number, and a positive number. Because negative one plus two is positive one. What's a negative times a negative times a positive? Positive. So that's up here. Can I leave you right here for a second to test numbers in the other two subintervals? You can pick whichever numbers you want. I'll pick very certain ones in a second, but you can probably guess which ones I'm going to pick. This might not have been enough time for you to finish, but here's what I would have done. For the next subinterval, I would have used 1, and that would have been a positive number, a negative number, and a positive number, which means it's negative. And for the last interval, I would have used 10 because it's aggressively larger than 2. Yes. And it's an easy number to multiply by. I didn't understand. This would have been 10, or sorry, <laughs> would have been 50, so that's a positive number. This still is a positive number. And then this is a positive number, which means the last subinterval is above the x axis. Whew. Okay, but now how do we write the final answer? I don't know. Okay, <laughs> let's think back to what we're actually doing here. We're solving an inequality. Do we want where this inequality is above the x-axis or below the x-axis? Above. So we need to list the subintervals in interval notation that's above the x-axis. Those subintervals are from negative 2 to 0. Why did I switch to using brackets? Because it's closed. And including 2 to infinity. So there are two sections of this answer that are above the x-axis. Bonus question for a quick buck. Why did I switch to this symbol? Because you can't close, because infinity goes forever and ever and ever. Infinity goes forever and you can't close it. Very good. So infinities always have the parentheses, not a bracket, because it is exclusive, because technically we will never reach infinity, even if you tried for your whole life. So we're moving on to some imaginary number work. We already kind of talked about it for a hot sec. We already remembered this. We remembered that i is equal to the square root of negative 1. But it follows that fact. It means that also i squared is equal to negative 1. That's going to come in handy le later. Additionally, recall that the vocabulary word of complex conjugate, oops, that's not a highlighter, complex conjugate is basically the opposite sign for the imaginary part of a number. So if you have a plus bi, the complex conjugate is a minus bi, meaning if I give you 5 plus 4i, what is the complex conjugate for that? Okay, we need this for division. That's when we're going to be using the complex conjugate. We're going to do a bunch of arithmetic with imaginary numbers just to refresh our memory with it. A lot of it, real easy. Addition and subtraction, real easy. Because addition and subtraction, it's just like combining like terms. Technically, what you're doing is you're adding the real part of a number with another real part of a number and the imaginary part with another imaginary. Okay, it's combining like terms, essentially, right? So if we look at this first example, we have 3 plus 4i plus negative 4 plus 2i. I'm technically only adding two numbers together because they're complex numbers. Part of it is real, part of it is imaginary. But all I have to do is combine the two parts together. So the real parts would be added together. That's negative 1. And the imaginary parts would be added together. 4i plus negative 2i, that's 2i. Easy peasy. Right? There's not even another example to try on that one because that's how easy it is. For subtraction, just as easy, same way you subtract like a polynomial. Uh, 
I like it don't require you to do it this way if you can see it all the way without having to do this first step. I like doing that distribution step first, like personally as a mathematician, so that I remember what actually I'm adding together here. So I'm just going to add the opposites. That means I'm adding positive 3 and a negative 2i because subtracting is adding the opposite. I just personally like that. I don't need you to do that part. If you can subtract them and not lose your positive negatives, that's fine too. I need this as a mathematician. But then again, we can just add our real parts together and our imaginary parts together, which actually would be negative 7i. Cool, great, awesome. We love adding and subtracting. Very easy. Until it's not. No, I'm just kidding. Multiplication. You definitely spent some time in Algebra 2 whenever you took that class, either a year or two years ago, working on multiplication in various ways. So multiplication of a polynomial and multiplication of a complex number are going to be very similar. Some of you learned it, uh, the FOIL method. Does that sound familiar? Yes. Or double distribution. Does that also sound familiar? I think. Those sorts of things is what you're using again. So you're just multiplying twice. So we're going to multiply 1 times 3. That's 3. You're going to multiply 1 times negative 2i. That's negative 2i. You're going to multiply 3i times 3, that's 9i. And you're going to multiply 3 times negative 2i, which is negative 6i squared. Because i times i is i squared, same way x times x is x squared. Here's where it gets interesting. You have like terms. You can combine them. But you also have an i squared, bless you. What did i squared equal? We wrote, it was written on your other page? Negative 1. So we can replace the i squared with a negative 1, meaning that this can simplify down to 3. This would be plus 7i, because I'm combining those like terms. And this would be negative 6 times negative 1, because i squared is negative 1. Well, what's negative 6 times negative 1? Six. So this is actually just 3 plus 7i plus 6. Is there something else I can combine now? Three yeah, it's just going to be 9 plus 7i. So when you multiply two complex numbers together, you get a complex number. Because the i squared becomes negative 1, you should still end up with two values. I have a question. Yes. Could you just, like, if it shows you any type of, like, i squared information, could you just flip that number since it basically is going to the same formatting. I'm okay with you going from here to here. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yes. I don't need to see this step if you don't need it. I do want to see this step, though. Okay. I want to see the I squared, not just an immediate change to negative 1. Okay. But I'm okay with you going straight from here to making that a positive 6. I get why that, came, that became positive 6. That's a good question. Okay. Just to make sure we got it, we're going to do one harder. Why is this one harder? Because it's a square. Ooh, you know, when I started doing these notes this time, I did them, you know, before, when I've taught this class before. I missed that. Don't miss it, like I did. There's a squared there. What does that squared mean? Bless you. There's going to be another 2 minus 3i. Bless you. There's going to be another 2 minus 3i. So if we wrote this all the way out, it's 2 plus 3i, 2 minus 3i, 2 minus 3i. Ooh, we're going to multiply three complex numbers together, which you totally can. But do you notice something about something up there that's kind of peculiar? The complex. Yeah. They're complex conjugates. They're complex conjugates of each other. This is good. The reason complex conjugates are helpful is because it actually follows the difference of two squares rules because they're the same thing, one positive, one negative. So we can use both of those ideas, complex conjugate and the difference of two squares rule, to multiply this way faster, and you actually get a way simpler number, which is, again, why we use complex conjugates. I'm going to multiply it all the way out, just in case you don't see the difference of two squares pattern yet. This is going to be 4 minus 6i plus 6i minus 9i squared.
all of that still multiplied by 2 minus 3i. Don't forget about that one. Okay, what do you notice about the stuff in the middle? They cancel each other out. Negative 6i, positive 6i, gone. We also just talked about what i squared means. What does i squared mean? Negative 1. So really this is 4 plus 9. Mm -hmm. So look at that. We end up with just a regular solid constant, a real number, instead of a complex number. If you notice that there are complex conjugates, which again is why we need them, they're going to multiply out to a regular real number. And then we can finish multiplying this problem out because it's just a simple distribution. Ah, algebra, we love it. This is 26 minus 39i. So division. Division requires multiplication because we can't actually do dividing by complex numbers unless you multiply by the complex conjugate. Specifically of the denominator. It's going to allow us to be having a real number only, a whole number, an integer in the denominator that we can then use to represent this complex number. So that means for example one here, what am I going to be multiplying both the top and bottom by? 1 minus 2i. Yes, the complex conjugate of the denominator. Okay, that means the top of this is going to be a FOIL or a double distribution problem. And the bottom is going to be a difference of two squares, just like we did up at the top. And I'm going to use the shortcut this time for difference of two squares. And if you don't see the shortcut, you can FOIL the bottom too. It will come out, should come out, to a regular integer. So we FOIL the top. 2 times 1 is 2. 2 times negative 2i is negative 4i. 3i plus 1 times 1, sorry, is positive 3i, and 3i times negative 2i is negative 6i squared. I just foiled the top two complex numbers, double distributed. I just didn't do arrows and I didn't do it in color. The denominator is the difference of two squares pattern. The pattern says that if you have a first number that's squared and a second number that's squared, it factors to exactly what we have as the factors here. So we can work backwards. That means the first thing needs to be squared. It's a difference, so there's a subtraction sign. And then the second thing needs to be squared. We're just using that formula backwards from the way you're probably used to seeing it. Instead of taking some polynomial and putting it in factors, we're taking the factors, putting it in a polynomial, because we notice it's the pattern. Now we're just down to simplifying. The numerator is going to simplify to 2 minus i plus 6. How did I get this plus 6? i squared is equal to negative 1. Negative 6 times negative 1 is positive 6. The denominator is going to become 1 minus 4i squared. Where did that come from? Where did I get this 4 from? Squaring the 2. And squaring the i. When there's two things in there, they both have to be squared. So 2 squared is 4. i squared is i squared. And what is i squared? What is another way I can write that? As negative 1. So this is really 8 minus i divided by 1 my, uh, plus 4. We know how to do that math. 8 minus i divided by 5 is the final answer. So the denominator, again, should come out to a regular number, regular integer, a real number. And the top will remain a complex number for your final answer. You're going to try the next one on your own, so I want to make sure we have questions answered before we do that. So take a pause. Where's our questions? So the formula for dots, if we think back to, I think it's on the Algebra 2 formula chart, but I know for sure it's on the Algebra 1. This is the actual formula for difference of two squares. It says if you have something, a first thing that's squared, and you're subtracting 
another thing that's squared, you can immediately factor it into a minus b, a plus b. But we notice that we actually have the ending part, right? That's what this looks like. We've got something plus something and something minus something in factors. So I can work backwards where I'm going to take the first thing in the parentheses and I'm just going to square it, which in this case was 1, right? Because it's the first thing in the parentheses. Then I'm going to take the second thing in the parentheses and I'm going to square it. So this is the second thing in the parentheses and I'm going to square it. And I use a minus. And then I can do 1 squared is 1, 2i squared is 4i squared because 2 times 2 is 4, i times i is i squared. Is that better? If, that, if you're still like, mm, nope, not better, you really can just foil that out. First, outer, inner, last, and you'd end up with the same thing eventually because the middle terms will cross out. That's okay. If you feel ready to attack the next one, go ahead and get started. You've got people near you. You can ask questions. If you still have one for me, I'll be here. Okay, so again, on this one, we multiply by the complex conjugate, foil the top, double distribution, either double distribution or notice the difference of two squares pattern for the bottom, and then it's just simplifying using that I squared equal to negative one um, idea. Speaking of I squared being equal to negative one, that's going to be really helpful for these powers of I's. Because we know I squared is equal to negative one, if we have negative one, raised to some even power, then that is going to be equal to 1. If we have negative 1 raised to some odd power, like 3, negative 1 to the third power, is going to be negative 1. Those three facts right there are going to help us simplify these complicated looking problems and make them ridiculously easy. Okay, so those are the three facts we need. We can rewrite these higher powers of i in terms of i squareds, meaning if I wanted to rewrite i to the 28th power, I could technically write that using exponent rules as i to the second power raised to the 14th power. Why is that true? Because 2 times 14 is 28. Yes. Exponent rules say that if you have a power raised to a power, all you have to do is multiply them. So this would still be i to the 28th power. I've not changed the problem at all. I've just rewritten it. I could also rewrite i to the 37th power as i squared to the 18th power times i. Why does that work? What's 18 times 2? Oh, 36. 36, and then I have an extra 1, and exponent rules say if you're multiplying the two bases together, you just add the exponent. So 36 plus 1 is 37. So how could I represent this last little bit in terms of i squared? I squared to the 25 I. times i with an i at the end. Very good. So that's 2 times 25 is 50, 51 with this extra 1 right here. Okay, fabulous. Cool. Now we need those other facts right there. If you have i squared, isn't that the same thing as negative 1? And if you have negative 1, which we do because i squared is negative, we have negative 1 raised to the 14th power. What is that? It's 1. Why is it 1? Because uh, 14 is an even number. Yeah, remember this is saying negative 1 to the 14th power. That's an even number because i squared is negative 1. The second part, what is i squared to the 18th power? It's an even number. So 1, but we still have an i sticking there at the end. How about the last one, i squared to the 25th power? It would be negative 1 because it's an odd number, but we still have an i sitting there. What do you notice about this last line of the equation? Yeah, these are opposites. Your final answer is just one. Like I said, looks super complicated. 
Unfortunately, easy answer. Yes. When I'm talking about the powers being even or odd, I'm not talking about these because that's i's powers. I need i squared's powers to be even or odd because these are the ones that are actually negative one. Okay, so make sure you've actually done that step before you, you do the next one. So go ahead and try this last one, example two, last problem on our notes. I've talked for way too long today, so this should be the last one. Woohoo! Showed a little bit more work on this one than I did on the other in case that part was confusing. So I showed an extra line, just changing all of them to negative ones. And again, all of them in terms of i squared leave you with one i minus one plus one at the end. Minus one plus one cancel out, so it's just one i or i.